Uh, I'm Alex, I'm the interim CEO here at, at Wired Sussex. Just to welcome you to the first of our Lunch and Learns for 2023. Um, and uh, before I uh, introduce John, uh, just to say uh, on the tables here, uh, there are some flyers. Uh, one for the, uh, the mighty Wired Sussex Jobs Board. Please use it to recruit all your new staff. Um, it's a wonderful way to connect with good people um, and to get them good jobs. Uh, and it supports Wired Sussex. There's also a flyer for upcoming events. Uh, it's been one of my privileges and pleasures uh, as interim CEO to start programming the events for 2023. Um, and uh, we've got some really good ones coming up, so keep an eye on the uh, Wired Sussex events page. Take that flyer away and come back for the next Lunch and Learn and various other things that are going on. Um, as I said, it's been, it's been good fun uh, scheduling these things. Um, and I wanted particularly to, um, to have something on SAS uh, for uh, the start of this year. Uh, lots of people have been speaking to me about it. It's been a constant topic of conversation uh, with my colleagues at COGAP uh, about how we can uh, perhaps venture into this field. And I know lots of people who are, who are either in the middle of this or starting it or thinking about it. And in that context, I couldn't think of anyone better to talk about it than, than, than John, who's our good long-term uh, friend and associate from the SCIF and various other ventures, and who's uh, been through the SAS process of development and uh, successful implementation on several occasions, and um, knows more about this than anyone else I know. So I'm really pleased to have John here to talk about it, and I'll hand over to him. John's going to give a presentation, and then we'll have some Q&A and usual stuff. All right, thanks very much. John. Hi everyone. Uh, so as uh, Alex mentioned, I'm going to go through a, a presentation where I'll cover some high level things and um, introduce you to, uh, to a couple of uh, SaaS businesses uh, in Brighton that you may or may not be aware of. Um, and, um, but I'm very keen to get into any detailed questions that you like. You're welcome to interject if you like part way through or we can, uh, we can wait, wait to the end. Um, uh, so looking forward to seeing how it goes. Um, so, first of all, um, how many people recognize any of these companies? Uh, anyone recognize more than half of them? No? Interesting. How, so, five? Anyone five? Six? Which one? Which, tell me a couple of the ones you know. Yeah, great, cool. And does anyone work with any of them, by the way? No, no, no team members, okay. Yep, cool. All right, so uh, these are all companies I class as successful Sussex SaaS businesses. Um, and uh, that means that they were, in my mind, they were either built here um, they were grown here in the region or they were sold here. Um, some of them have quite large teams that are in other countries or in, in other parts of the UK, um, but they all have quite a close connection to, to, to Sussex. Um, and um, some things that make them successful in my mind are none of them had a particularly large dependency on external funding. So these aren't um, companies that you might have seen so much in the media because they didn't get loads of uh, funding, which creates a big press event that everyone in the tech industry goes uh, crazy for. Um, uh, at least 12 of them are making more than a million a year. Um, some of them quite a lot, a lot more, but I believe most are under uh, sort of 20 um, uh, million a year max, probably mostly closer to the sort of five and, and one. Um, at least six uh, employ more than 10 people and by all accounts, they create really nice uh, places to work. Um, and um, one of the critical things, they provide their founders with um, much more choice about how they work and, and where they work and how they do business compared to a lot of other business models. Um, uh, they can choose to operate, for example, completely asynchronous if, if they wanted to, but 
based on the, the, the type of business. They, it's easier for them to instigate things like four-day um, work weeks and remote working, and, and many of them were 100% um, remote from before the pandemic, and a lot more of them post-pandemic are, are significantly remote. And six of those um, have sold for life-changing amounts of, of money, multiple millions, um, uh, quite a few relatively recently as well. Anyone recognize either of these two? Probably not. So uh, these were my first two SaaS businesses um, which made any money. So I've taken on loads of things over the years. These two made some money um, uh, over a decade ago. Uh, um, but I would class them as many, two of many unsuccessful uh, SaaS businesses, even though they did, did make a, bit, a little bit of money. And so um, while they were unsuccessful, uh, they did, you know, one of them served a couple of big brands, uh, Nestle and Index Ventures. Index Ventures um, wasn't so well known back then, but it's uh, a very big venture capitalist com company. They backed Dropbox and Figma and, and lots of other well-known uh, companies, so they're kind of a big deal. Um, uh, How Sociable had over 20,000 users. Um, we got to $1,000 a month uh, MRR, put loads of work into them. Raised about $40,000 uh, for one, but then we had a very painful co-founder breakup. Uh, and, um, and I sold How Sociable for a seven-figure exit. Um, but I was living in South America at the time, so that's pesos, which means it's pretty close to 10,000, uh, a bit, bit more than 10,000 pounds. It wasn't, wasn't a big deal, but uh, lots, of, lots of lessons learned. And, um, and there are many more lessons um, that I've been able to learn from working with lots of businesses that didn't feature on that uh, early slide and that sadly haven't, haven't made it. And so hopefully I'll share a few of, uh, sh few of the things I've learned from those um, coming up. So some specific mistakes I made. Um, I didn't really have uh, a proper appreciation of the value that I'd created. Um, no, what, knowing what I know now with those two businesses that failed and I see as unsuccessful, they're in a much better state, actually, in some respects, than a lot of other businesses now. And I could apply things that I now know to probably make them into, into decent businesses. Didn't know, didn't know that there was that much value in it at the time. Um, uh, I had quite an empathy failing with my co-founder, who was in a very different um, sort of life and family um, point, um, which, which caused that breakup. So it's very important to really know your founders and understand um, what's, what's going on and what they want and, and, and make sure that matches what you're doing. Um, and I became very dependent, uh, the uh, How Social in particular was very dependent on a single data provider, um, which, uh, which made it extremely difficult. To, there was no profit at all. There was no margin at all in that, in that $1,000 um, for even any, uh, for anyone to be paid anything. Um, even though I was living in South America and it could have been, uh, <laughs> could, could have just about got by on that much. Um, and, um, but I had already decided to go full time and that was way too early to, to, to do it. Um, so it was unsustainable. Um, I wish I, uh, the world was more connected back then or I'd taken, made more effort to talk to more people because people could have highlighted the, that actually what, what the value was that I had and I maybe could have made different choices. And I really rushed the sale um, uh, because I needed the money. <laughs> um, and um, and that, was a, that was a mistake in retrospect. Um, so uh, oftentimes over the last decade plus, I mean, I'm a, my background's in software development, so, uh, you know, since I came out of university, 2006 time, you get a steady stream of people asking if you can build their idea. Um, and so I've seen all sorts of things from, from social networks to more B2B uh, services and things. And so, you know, typically someone will ask things like, is this thing that they want to build a good idea? Um, how can they build it and where can they find the money to find it? And um, as much as books that I guess fairly well known like the Lean Startup have popularized different ways of thinking about this, this, this still feels like the way that most people uh, start. Um, and really what you need isn't one idea, it's four ideas to, to start a SaaS business in my mind. So those four ideas are one, who it is that you actually, that you want to help. Um, uh, how is it that you can get their attention and keep their attention in some way? What can you um, make for them 
is probably something to figure out after you've figured out those, those first two rather than starting with it is the ideal. Um, and, then, um, and then figure out how you can actually technically build it. This would be the ideal starting point for, um, for, for, for building a, a SaaS business, like many businesses. Uh, and, um, but, it, but, it's, but it's wishful thinking. Not, you know, it's hard to get to that point. Uh, and I've worked on successful SaaS businesses that didn't have that when they started. Um, so the big alternatives that you have to having all those four when you start is lots of money, lots of time, or um, a, lot, a lot of luck. And of course, the more money and time you invest in something, inevitably the more luck you get, it, it turns out. Um, and so a process that you can uh, take if you have some time or some money uh, and, um, and, and you're willing to, to, to try your luck with it um, is that you can just uh, you can get started. You can start making something for yourself. You can make that idea into something um, tangible. You can start sharing it um, with people. And then you have to look, listen very carefully uh, to the feedback um, that you get and ask the right questions. And there's a huge amount to learn just in that whole process um, of, uh, of really empathizing with the people to understand what it is um, that, uh, that, that they like or don't like or what you could build on and where the, if there's a, an opportunity for a, for a business in there. And if you're doing that and you're prepared to invest time and money, maybe just be yourself or, or a small team, um, you can build some confidence doing this uh, on repeat that you can build things that are useful to people and you don't know how to ship commercial software, for example. And if you're starting from a point where you've not done that before, this can be useful and you can get value out of it, even if you're not maybe yet at the point where you'll, you'll get a business. Um, next, uh, you, uh, from there, you can um, repeat over and over again, and it's just about discipline. Uh, keeping using that time and that money until it, until it runs out. Um, ideally trying to focus in on one very specific audience, um, then sharing and promoting what it is that you're doing consistently so people know that you're in this space helping this particular audience and, there, and there's awareness of it. And then doing deeper and deeper research into that um, audience to really understand them and show that you can keep continuously develop more, more software. Um, and, and continuously help them in, in some way. And eventually taking that process, you can get to the point of uh, knowing who it is um, uh, that you can help and um, how to get their attention and what, you can make, what it is that you can make for them that is uh, useful and valuable for them and, then, and you would have learned all the process around um, building it. Um, and when you're at that point and you have uh, something that is... You know, it might even be investable. So surely you, you, you could have a lot more confidence about um, uh, putting, putting more time into it. Um, then you can start worrying about more of uh, the details, um, which can be very overwhelming um, when, you, when you get started. Um, I won't go into all of these, but there's lots of very small choices that can completely change the shape of the business that you ultimately um, go on to, to, to build. Some of those will be dictated by the particular people that you're choosing to serve or how it is that you're deciding to reach them. Uh, like, for example, whether or not you can offer a software business low touch. So there's a pricing table on your website and you've figured out how to get people to get that far and actually put their credit card number in and buy it and you, you can make that work. Or if you need to have something that's a bit more high touch where you either have a sales team or a partner network or, or something like that to, to make the... The, the transaction happen. There's lots of um, different steps. I can share this and give you a bit more detail on what each of these, these things are um, uh, afterwards. Um, and then there's things like um, uh, choosing which software stack is the right one to use, uh, what to automate and what not to automate, and just to do manually for as long as you, you can do it. If you need to worry about names and trademarks and patents and domain names and IP, how you do billing, how you deal with tax, um, if you need contracts or what the contract should look like, um, and um, uh, I mean you, you should all the time be worried about you know things that are very risky in uh, providing software around security and privacy and uh, making sure that you can you can recover from from disasters. There's all this scary stuff. Um, but none of it matters if you don't have those four ideas or you haven't got to that, that point. 
so uh, a, st a specific story of um, going through this process. So uh, it's almost 10 years ago now. Um, Brighton agency uh, Propellernet. How many people know Propellernet? A few people. Uh, so I think they must be coming up to 20 years old now as, a, as an agency. Um, and um, in uh, uh, probably about a year before that they first sort of got in touch with me and asked if uh, I had any advice on they wanted to get into to building a, a software business. Um, and um, and I, I, was, I was in South America at the time, so I suggested some, some books, uh, suggested some events and things for them to go to, and they, uh, uh, Jack, the, the, the founder, met a young um, developer at a Sussex, uh, uh, Sussex founders meetup um, uh, who he hired, and they started trying to make some software and experimenting with lots of different ideas um, that they had. Um, and so, uh, sort of nine months or so later, they got back in touch, and this was, would have been 2013, said, so we've got loads of different ideas, all these different things, and the situation was that they'd grown the business to sort of, I think it was between 40 and 50 uh, people doing agency, so it's pretty much day rate work um, uh, of mostly SEO with, with some PR um, marketing, and um, they'd looked at ways that they could grow the business further and decided, you know, and they almost went down the route of an expansion to Australia and, uh, and, the, and the Far East, but they decided, no, they liked the team size, but they did want to grow the business. So they didn't want to add more and more people. Um, and so they were prepared to, uh, to try and, and build a software out of the, out of the products they had and, and, and involve mostly the team that they, that they already had. And so they asked me if I could uh, figure out a way to help do it. So uh, we devised a. Um, f first of all, I sort of I did it. We did a review of all the ideas they had, a big long list, and talked to everyone in the company to try and get some idea of which one of those, which ones would be particularly useful. Um, and uh, we uh, we run kind of like an accelerator program um, over a, over a three month period with a, with three teams. Um, main focus being on on one that that uh, had their two primary software developers um, in it, and um, we focused on building something for the, for the agency, because they didn't have those set of four ideas, they just really wanted to do this, and they were, wanted to put some money in, put some time in, and they had a team of people that were really excited about, about doing it. Um, and so what we ended up building was uh, a, uh, a CRM for their process of um, doing uh, PR and, and sort of link outreach. Uh, and so there's a CRM called Perfect Fit, you know, it's perfectly built to their process, and um, had one uh, developer who was particularly amazing, Dan, who pretty much built the first version in a week, and then we got it into the hands of uh, of the teams um, to start using it. And it was like it was an upgrade from the spreadsheet that they were that they were using before, and they absolutely loved it. And the internal team they were they lived inside this new CRM. It was their their tool, uh, and um, and at the end of the three months. The main achievement was this was, from everyone's perspective, it was production ready. They could, they did not want to turn it off. They couldn't live without it. Uh, the team um, was very confident that they had built commercial software for the first time after they'd just been tinkering on, on, on different scripts. Uh, and um, we'd learned a lot through the through the whole process of, of working with users and, and solving different technical problems and, and all the rest of it. And uh, and we we there was a there was a presentation. A bit like this to the to the whole company, and um, and then we kind of asked openly, should we keep going with this? And the the shouts were hell yes because it had become so important uh, internally to the to the team, and so they decided to invest further, managed to gear that team up to being full time. So they hadn't been they'd only taken sort of a couple of days a week uh, to, uh, to to build that first version, so geared that up, um, and um, decided to give it at least six months on this uh, project because it had been received so well, tried to, tried to sell it to other agencies. Um, so um, so then we're trying to try and answer these questions. Who, who is it uh, that are going to help? Uh, how do we get their attention? Um, what can you make for them? And how can we build it with them? So we already had this thing. And um, there were they had sort of networks into other PR companies because of the team had worked in, in other places before. 
So they used the network they had and they, we did all sorts of things and decided that we were aiming at PR companies in particular rather than, than the SEO. So it could have gone either way, but it was the PR companies that, that decided they could help the most and bring and sort of upskill them and introduce them to SEO th ideas, which should really help Propellinet grow as a, as a, as a, as a company mixing those two, um, two worlds. And so um, the, they got their attention by doing what they do. They, directly got in touch with people, they went and saw them, they met, met up with them, uh, and over the course of about six months, we managed to get about uh, between five and ten um, other PR agencies bought this and were, loved the idea and thought, yes, this could streamline uh, how, we, how we work and make us efficient and all the rest of it. And, um, and, they, and they, they'd sold it by hand, one by one, uh, and we're making well over, a, it was probably a couple of thousand a month um, at, at, at this point, so because it was quite a high touch sale, they were selling it for more than 100 pounds or maybe 50 pounds a seat, something like, something like that. Um, and, um, and we're looking at those numbers and, and no one was using it. We're like, this is really frustrating. We love it, we're using it internally, but none of the people that we're selling this to, and they, they love it when we sell it to them, they don't, they're, not, they're not using it. And we just, uh, were quite flummoxed by this, so spent lots of time talking to uh, the uh, the people we'd sold it to, and they couldn't really work it out. And they said, "Oh, you should talk to um, talk to the people that are actually use it. They were telling to use it." And so we went. You know, I remember one meeting uh, very distinctly. Uh, we're in a room, not quite this big, but we're probably as many people packed into it. And um, and these are all people that are. In their spreadsheet, you know, most of their day they're spending doing outreach to journalists uh, and doing doing the job of a of a, of a PR on on the ground um, and have their big spreadsheets of, to to work through. And they're people that should really help uh, the most. And um, and they were just super frustrated by it. They were frustrated that uh, they were having to break away from their normal work and they just needed to get all the work done that they wanted to get done. Um, but they were also, they also, they were bought into the tool. They loved the output, the reports that, that, that came out at the other end. So we took some time and literally sat next to them to understand what it is that they were doing and what their, what their process was. And it turned out it was so specific to each agency, there was no way that, that, that we, you know, the amount of onboarding work we would have to do to get them to use this new tool was way more than we wanted to do. We realized we were gonna to have to become a trading company or come up with a, a different kind of business model. And it would have been valid. We could have done that, but because the goal of RepellerNet was that they didn't want to increase their headcount, that, that wasn't compatible with the, that sort of core, core principle. Um, and so um, we were, yeah, we, we sort of wanted to stick with it and try, figure out how we could simplify the experience so that people could on, onboard themselves. But this one golden uh, piece of information was that they really loved the output and the report. Challenge was they had to use it for a week, clicking all the check boxes and having the relationships of every person before they got the report out of the other end. And, um, and so we thought, how about... Um, because they love it, and, and some, some individuals, once they see how great the output is, if they see, once they know it's there, once they see they can create it, maybe that'll be enough of a carrot to get them to onboard properly and, and, and use it. So we spent a couple of days and we ripped that one feature out for creating the reports into uh, an app of its own. Um, and we, we stuck it up on a, on a web page where people could uh, put in uh, the list of URLs that, of the coverage that they had received, which generated this, this report. Uh, and it would uh, grind some gears and spit out a PDF, uh, essentially out of the other end of the report, which they could then give their clients. And our purpose of doing this was not to uh, to create an app, but th 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 that we could sell, but just as lead gen. Because if people saw that, they'd give us their email address for the for the PDF, and then we could sort of have a whole sales process uh, to 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 get them on board. And at the same time, because we were sort of back in ideas mode at this uh, sort of most of the way through this 12 month period. We also launched another app uh, to, to try and get some lead gen uh, where people could put a keyword in and it would go and do, um, to get you some ide content ideas and it would go and play with Google's uh, autocomplete to, to, and, and, and came back with a nice visualization which we generated a few by hand inside PropellerNet which is nice for pitching uh, clients and say these are all the different things that we could write about or get people to write about. And so we just put these two things up on, on the internet as lead gen, and um, 
uh, and then hope people would use it. Or we started sharing it with all those people that, that had used the other tool and they started using it. And uh, lots of people started using it. Well, lots in comparison to perfect fit, the previous tool. So we had a couple of hundred people over a, a couple of month period that, that, that used it. And we realized they were much more excited about this than they'd been ever, ever been excited by the, uh, the main tool. And so we thought, well, you know, there's not many features that we can add to this, but why don't we just put some, a way to charge people for it, for doing multiple uh, reports and things and, uh, and, and see what happens. Um, and we did that, and very quickly we had people self-serving. So within three months of making that tool, even though we were a year into this whole process, we had something that people were buying um, by themselves, and, uh, and we knew specifically who, who, who they were. So um, we knew that they were actually, they weren't people that ran PR companies, they were people that were on the front line doing PR work. Um, we, uh, the getting their attention initially, we, we we could get their attention just by talking to them. They liked the fact that we were, we were looking out for them. There weren't other software companies that were trying to solve uh, their problems. Later, we realized it was quite relatively easy to reach PR people via Twitter. So we, we used Twitter um, ads um, all that, that time ago to, um, to get their attention. And um, we, uh, we, we had this thing that we knew that we could make for them. Um, and we'd, we'd figured it out by Try and error how to how to build something for that that team, um, and um, and then and and we grew from there. We focused on that audience and basically spent another eighteen months just going round and round of complete focus. And we created eBooks and did various different things, very much helping um, the uh, uh, account executive in in PR firms, educating them about SEO. Um, and introducing this this tool to them, spending a lot of money on on Twitter ads uh, to, to to get their attention, keeping talking to them, keeping shipping new features, and um, by that point we had something that we knew uh, could keep going. The company had invested uh, probably about one year's worth of profit in total over three years, so they'd never risked the the main business. They 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 just uh, they, did, they basically reinvested half of their of their profit for a, for a couple of years, um, and um, yeah, and they had the, a little SaaS business that was growing. It wasn't at the point yet where it competed um, with the agency for profit, but it was it was it was up and um, running, uh, and that was probably 2016. We got to the, that point, um, and uh, and meanwhile, uh, that other little tool that we created and occasionally. Uh, popped in on to have some fun with and put videos on and change the visualization, uh, which is called Answer the Public. Um, we left it out there for free, and the main reason we noticed it was because we put this uh, video of this uh, uh, of a, a sort of friend of the agency, and we'd made this quite um, fun video where he was sort of tapping the search box, and it was meant for a campaign for the for the agency, um, but we, we we put it on this page, and it turned out a lot of the SEO industry. Uh, really loved this character and changing the, uh, the, the, the character over time. And so they'd, it, it had this sort of loyal um, set of users, even though there were some competing tools that did almost exactly the same thing. And um, before we knew it, we were getting these huge bills uh, just from the video hosting. Uh, and so it's costing us thousands a month in video hosting because so many people were looking at it. We realized we'd, uh, we'd got to um, tens of, and, and later hundreds of thousands of visits a day. I think I checked it last week and it's up to about a million uh, a month, that is. Um, and um, really popular at all. Uh, we uh, w w uh, eventually decided that we should probably have a paid version of that and did that in um, 2019, I, I think it is. And it had a much faster growth rate than the, than the other product. Um, and then eventually, uh, last year, Answer the Public, which was that little side project, sold for more than $8 million. Uh, dollars, um, uh, and with no, with no employees changing hands, by the way, so that was, uh, the whole team got to stay with, with, the, with, with the coverage book, uh, and, um, and, and Answer the Public was sold. Uh, and uh, coverage book is in an even stronger position with um, more than 2,000 uh, customers now. Um, and uh, yeah, and both of them have been highly profitable for for years. Uh, so there we have two success stories out of one 
um, business. And the other SaaS that I showed earlier, are, um, you know, they, they've got different stories, but getting to that point of having those um, four different ideas is the, is the key thing um, that, that, that helped them all get onto the trajectories that they're, they're all on. Um, so, of course, the best uh, time to start any of these kinds of business was, uh, like many things, 10 years ago. The second best time is now. Um, and, uh, yeah, and these are, the, the, these are other companies that, um, that, that you could potentially join uh, on a, as a, as a Sussex-based SaaS. And um, how do they look uh, when they're in, uh, having good years uh, and in a good place? They have a, uh, you know, where, where I deem them to be a success is they've got this fairly calm source of uh, revenue. I wouldn't, don't go as far as to call it passive. It's not passive. You, you've got to look after software. You're responsible for the software. You have customers uh, to look after. But um, because it's, uh, it's, it's predictable and pretty resilient, you can... Um, founders can take extended leave. Uh, so some, in, in some cases, I know founders which um, have decided not to exit and instead been able to take a three-month sabbatical and, it just, and the business still be there when they get back and, and then they can just leave it ticking over comfortably. Um, things like the pandemic can hit and while a couple of those businesses did get hit pretty hard, um, They've, they've come through it a lot easier than, than, than other businesses, uh, certainly like the SCIF, uh, the co-working space I run has been, really struggled to come out of the pandemic, but um, uh, the software businesses are going to, like this, are in a great place for it. Um, and a lot of them, uh, one of the things I love most about it is seeing a lot of the, the lovely things that they do for their, for their staff, uh, like because of the way they work, it's much easier for them, as I mentioned earlier, to go to four-day work week. Coverage book team, we managed to go to a four-day work week in, I think, in 2018 for almost the, the whole, whole team. Um, and, um, and going to 90% uh, to remote vested, who I also worked with, we did that in uh, probably around the same time, 2017, 2018. Um, and they had an office uh, in London that was just being barely used um, for, a, for a few years before that. Um, and, uh, and, and all sorts of other uh, lovely things are much easier when you've got high margins and, and, and no uh, time constraints. Uh, and, uh, and the founders have a lot of options, like there was a choice to be able to, to sell um, Answer the Public. And, and now, more so than 10 years ago, it's much, uh, there's much more understanding around how companies like that can be valued. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of uh, paths, um, to various different paths to take uh, to sell a business if that's what you're, what you're choosing to do. Um, so things to start practicing, um, to ideally get you to the point where you've got those four ideas before uh, you start. Um, do something uh, that more directly makes money or time for you. Uh, so with Propellernet, building a great agency, um, even though uh, agencies are different kinds of businesses and, and, and some people don't have, don't find them as appealing as a SaaS, it's better to start with a platform of that kind of a business or a, good, a strong consulting business or, or freelance business if, you, if you're on your own than to sort of just go all straight in on a, on a SaaS without any kind of other revenue to, uh, to back you up. Uh, learn and practice as much uh, customer research as you can. I've got a couple of book suggestions um, on that uh, to help. Um, try and build a very focused audience. Um, so think in terms of how specific coverage book was that worked for them. Uh, literally junior account executives at PR firms. And then think about what you can do for them uh, that um, would encourage them to become your followers or to subscribe to a, to a newsletter uh, other way or, or to just turn up at your blog regularly. Are there things that you can do for them such that you can get to know them and, they, and you start building trust uh, with them early? Uh, try building things maybe just for fun so you have the experience of, uh, you know, without the expectation that it's definitely going to make you money straight away uh, so that you can... Um, Use all those muscles uh, that will uh, that will come in handy when you when you have a SaaS or you have those four ideas ready, um, and um, and pay attention to if you're employed or employing people in other ways the things that um, you wish you could do if you had a different kind of uh, business model um, or. Uh, 
things that you wish your boss would have been able to do for those. And I, I encourage you to sort of write them down and sort of remember them now and experience them before you have a SAS, because that can help you empathise much more with your, with your employees when you, when you have them in your, your rigor. Um, these are the books uh, I recommend. Um, Tiny MBA by Alex Hillman sort of uh, has a lot of quite high level philosophy on lots of little things learned over a decade of, of business and Alex has very similar experiences to my mind to my own even though he's US based um, and just makes you uh, think um, and helps you consciously make some decisions that you might unconsciously make um, I think uh, through the process of starting any business it's not SaaS specific that uh, empathy deployed by Michelle Hansen. Uh, Michelle runs a uh, very successful SaaS called um, Geocodio, uh, and um, she, but she has a background in uh, in research in uh, customer research, and so she's sort of written up a very practical guide to how to interview customers in lots of different situations, literally right down to giving you scripts to to get you started. So it's a really good practical guide to. Uh, having conversations that if I had had earlier with, with Coverage Book, if we just decided at the very beginning the audience was junior PR account executives, I could have gone and used some of Michelle's methods to talk to them and maybe found out about their frustrations with the spreadsheet and how the report out the other end was one of the harder things to get to from, from, the, from the spreadsheet. Uh, obviously Awesome um, by April, April Dunford is uh, a book about... Um, positioning and it just helped me really uh, understand how a piece of software um, can be sold to different people as completely different things without it technically being much different. Uh, and so you can think of maybe uh, the one of the, the main output of coverage book is that it's screenshots of, of websites and there are lots of other applications of screenshots of websites. Uh, I happen to work for a, a, a business at the moment called URL Box, which um, is at the very lowest level of taking screenshots. Um, and they were, they were, I was a, uh, we were a customer of theirs through, through Coverage Book, and they sort of provide some of the infrastructure for, for Coverage Book. And um, it's just very interesting to see how much uh, URL Box can charge as a developer service doing screenshots versus how much Coverage Book is essentially charging per screenshot when it's very tightly focused on a uh, on, a, on on that end and value um, demand side sale demand side sales by Bob Wester is um, uh, a sales book written by an engineer so if you've got quite a technical mind it just make it just completely changes the way that you can think about the sales process and it just made a whole bunch of things click with me about understanding you're not just targeting uh, the junior account executive at a, uh, a PR firm, you're targeting them at a specific moment in time when they're feeling a particular pain. And if you can understand when, what point they are on the journey of understanding if they have a problem at all, and then trying to solve it, it can completely change the way that you talk to them. Uh, Badass Making Users Awesome by Kathy Sierra is, uh, just really helps you understand the user's point of view and gives you all sorts of great tips on just Think putting yourself in the tr in the shoes of someone maybe experiencing software for the first some soft, a particular piece of software for the first time. Uh, Traction by Gabrielle Weinberg gives you a, is like a playbook of all sorts of different channels that you can use for, for marketing and has a whole uh, framework for figuring out um, which way to sell. Is it ads or is it doing SEO or um, is it going to events? Uh, and finally, Just Fucking Ship by Amy Hoy is a uh, really lovely process for anyone that struggles to actually just ship something and has a, a really nice way even though it uses a swear word in its title and gets a bit of a stick for that um, and be careful with traction there's another book called traction which is which is different i hear it's also good i've not read it but it's it's not the one by gino wickman uh, it's the one by gabriel weinberg that's it uh thank you all very much um I'll try and I'll provide things like the list of books if you didn't manage to get them down and, and some other bits and pieces. I'll email over to you in a couple of days if you want to stick your email address in a form on that website. Um, 
And if you want to hang out with other SaaS founders, um, if you don't unsubscribe, I can uh, let you know about some walks uh, that we do uh, occasionally. And also, I'm going to be profiling other local SaaS um, businesses over the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Yeah, it wasn't actually the first tool that we used. So uh, there are various different services that you can use that you can send a URL to and it'll take a screenshot of. Uh, and so, um, yeah, we've used a few of them over the years and, and URL box uh, is the current one that, that they use. If you found that there was a competitor that essentially honed your service and just sold it at base or below base costs to try and gain traction, what would you do? Would you try and work on a different USP compared to them? Or? Uh, depends on lots of things. Um, the, the thing, you sort of get into the sort of later stage strategy. Often on the whole, I find that when you're trying, mean, I specialize mostly in, and I didn't make this clear, getting to sort of the first million uh, a year. And I, I mostly oh. use, you, in my experience, you don't need to worry about competitors. The world is very, very big. There are a lot of uh, uh, account, uh, junior account executives in different PR firms. It might be that if there is um, one company that already provides uh, a specific service, you can go more specific to, to, to get into the, um, uh, into the business you know, and um, get some of the market share that there is. But mostly, even in um, this particular uh, industry, most people are still using spreadsheets and PowerPoint. That is the bigger, the bigger competitor. So I'd primarily say don't worry about the competitor, just worry about the customers and how you're, how you're already reaching them because the competitors that do come in like that rarely can get the same sort of traction that you can because they haven't got the, tr they've got to do a lot of work to gain the trust. And at a certain price point, the price doesn't matter. Like coverage book is a hundred dollars, I think, a month still. It saves people so much time that they're not very few of their customers, I think, take a risk to pay half the price, you know, on a, on a product that's half the price of that, just when they don't know the founders and they don't know the company and they haven't, and the company hasn't done all that work to help them in in other ways. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. Um, it's it's hard. I mean, I'm figuring that out as part of the work I'm doing at the moment with with URL box as to as to what the best way for for them to grow is. But the the thing with URL box, for, for example, is they have a very loyal customer base of very technical customers that have used all the alternatives and decided that it's that it's the best. Uh, and so at the moment, we're just doubling down on 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 being the best. And so it is one of those horizontal. Services, but you but a challenge uh, in SaaS broadly that I see is it's it's much harder to launch something, especially something that's a horizontal now than it was ten years ago. URL Box was, has been around for ten years, so it kind of has that position, you know, not least in in Google's uh, rankings. Uh, and coming in and competing with them is therefore very uh, very difficult. Um, and um, and so sometimes the right thing to do is to double down because you're there and you've got that sort of uh, uh, beachhead or, or whatnot. Um, and um, but I, I I wouldn't suggest someone tries to compete directly with a company that exists already like that. That's a, that's a horizontal. I think it's much easier to start in a in a vertical where you're aiming at a very specific person in a very specific industry. And it might be that the right that, that URL box does uh, create. 
some product or the side that it going, uh, you know, shifting into a different, um, uh, shifting into a vertical is the right way way to go. Um, but it's a great business, actually, as, as it as it is. Does that help? Does, yeah. yeah. Thanks for the talk. That's a really interesting question. Um, not sure I can answer it. Uh, I know what I like is that, or what I encourage is for um, founders to try and put as much of their character into whatever they produce, so the, which gives it an extra dynamic of being, uh, like people like doing business with humans um, rather than computers, and, you, and it's easier to gain trust if you're open about who you are and you and you behave in a in in just your own uh, genuine way. Uh, I think with Coverage Book, for example, uh, Gary, the the CEO, has you know. Uh, a writing style that's quite different from other people and it's tempting to edit it and make it perfect and it's like actually no I think it works really nicely the way that he took his customers and it makes them uh, uh, yeah it adds that sort of human element um, we had uh, a fantastic designer who did a lot of work um, around the sorts of things that you're talking about um, once we'd gained some traction to really figure out what the brand was and the brand values which really informed uh, the whole experience um, in, in lots of different ways. That came later, um, although Stefan, who, who did that work, was there from the very beginning, so a lot of his character, I guess, we, we just sort of gave him free reign. And it's more about sort of who the team is and let them do the thing that is their way of doing things and the way they want to in, the, in, in those areas where maybe it doesn't matter, but they need to have, I guess, they have to have some empathy and contact with the end customers because you don't want to be producing something that's... Uh, that they're gonna, that they're they're just not not gonna like, um, yeah. Uh. Uh, I've not done so much of that kind of work myself. I guess what I might do is uh, there are some elements that work in SaaS and work in consulting, um, uh, having a, a way to, to, com to communicate with a group of, of those people, even if it's a small group. So maybe, you know, offering something that encourages people to get onto a mailing list. Of, of some kind and then you can build trust with them over time such that when you eventually ask them for something like their, their time to interview them or you know these days it can be extremely difficult even just a you know, $100 uh, isn't enough to get a lot of the people that I'd like to talk to uh, uh, to, to get their attention um, and so you just uh, yeah it's, it's, it's hard um, and It might, it might be. I guess what, what, the first thing, you, what you're trying to get to, I think in a high touch situation, is you want to get them on the phone or you want to go and meet them in person. And so it's, it's figuring out what the path is to, to getting there. And I guess in some situations it might be showing them 
this end report, would you like this? You can have this, uh, but you need to have a take a phone call with me or you need to let me come and meet you and then we can take it from there to figure out um, where, where, where you get to. But I think you, there needs to be something um, that's uh, a, a, a funnel of sorts where uh, you know where to reach or how to reach all those people that could be your customers and then you have a process where they're, they're uh, they're entering in one end and a few of them are coming out, you know, you're able to have that, that conversation with them. And so often a part way down there is it something like an email list because then you own that link to them and you can keep on um, talking to them. But there are lots of businesses that work very well doing outbound as well and they've just found they know their source of the list of companies, the list of individuals, maybe using LinkedIn tools or all sorts of other sales um, process tools. And they know that if they contact 100 of them, three of them will reply, and that's their process. And there's enough of them that they can keep on doing that. And so I, does that answer the... Chris. Uh, Chris, I think. I've got one question from the other side. Uh, I guess I personally um, uh, err towards buying rather than building things, and it's usually it's very easy to convince me as someone that buys soft, SaaS software to either start a trial or to or to just try or to if it's paid like anything up to a hundred dollars is quite easy to justify if you think that the benefit is that it could save you a couple of hours even, you know, if it's even that a month. And it's, so it's just having that investment mindset around it, I guess. And then being, uh, you know, if you've got good bookkeepers or accountants, like wait for them to, to make a noise about the ones that, uh, that, you, that, that you need to take off. And when you balance it against salaries, it's usually quite an easy... So I, uh, I guess when it comes to that, where they're kind of bait and switching you a little bit, um, then that some business that works really well for, often they're changing who it is they're aiming for at that point, and so they don't care about you. Uh, and, and maybe it's time for you to move on to something else, and it's a great opportunity for another SaaS to come in and, and, re and replace it. Uh, I've seen that happen a few times. I, I am... If I know that I'm coming dependent on something, then I will do a lot of due diligence on it, you know, and understand how something's funded. Like I will again favour a business that isn't VC funded, because some of the companies that I know that are most guilty of lock-in and um, uh, and really going up, you know, high end and not uh, sticking with the price that you started with or in any way, shape, or form, and really trying to pull you up into into a heavy sales process. They tend to be the ones that have taken venture funding and and have to make massive, huge revenue growth targets for it to be a, uh, a good return for, for their investors. Um, so, yeah, bearing that sort of stuff in mind, I, I, I guess it, it's almost unconscious at this point, but I will favour things that are independent and small, like those companies that, that came up here, rather than the ones that you might see on TechCrunch or that, that venture capital companies have invested in. Okay, we're, we're nearly out of time, but uh, just one more question. Pricing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a genius to work out that pricing is pretty important in these stories. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on how to how to do that pricing. You, you, the, the case study you talked about, £100 a month, I guess, is what, what you're talking about. It could have been £200 a month, couldn't it? Or it could have been £500 a month, or it could have been £50 a month. Yep. How, how did you make those decisions? How did you explore that space? Yeah, it's a... It's a very big topic. Uh, well, I've done uh, a lot of what I did actually in later years of coverage, but it was a lot of research around pricing and doing pricing surveys. And so I, I could probably do a whole talk on that. But the, um, 
the, the approach I tend to take is to, um, to pick a price that I would pay on the low end of it for a new product. Not really worried, because at the beginning, getting your the first customers actually are not about making money from them. It's about having them use the tool, and not, but not going so far that you're giving it away for free. And so I pick a, a price that's, that feels like a no-brainer, and maybe that's informed by the conversations that you're, you're having with them. So I wouldn't actually, often that means not jumping to $100 a month. So with Coverage Book actually, and Answer the Public, uh, I think the lowest starting price for Coverage Book, the first version was about 19 or 29 which is much easier for people to just, just stick on a, on a card. And we've, we've answered the public it was $49. Um, but then what we did is we, um, we put the prices up uh, later, but not on those initial customers. Like The benefit to you as being our early adopters and helping us out is that you get that price for life. There are things that you can do to encourage them to have a price later, but, but, but I like to take the approach of, no, that's the deal we did with you. Uh, that's that's, that's what, 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 what you've got unless you need more. Um, and um, and then introduce other price points and, and do some promotions around that sometimes. But uh, yeah, does that does that? And then so yeah, you're then trying. Fun. And and, yeah. and what, one of the main things actually that uh, I learned from Patrick Campbell, who, uh, who who talks a lot about pricing and and started uh, Profitwell, which is a, a metric service for SaaS. He has all sorts of material, but the number one thing on pricing is to try is to experiment with it regularly. Ideally, I've never managed to do this. You do it, you try and change it every three months, and hopefully you've got enough leads coming in that you can actually learn something from changing the pricing every three months. And that's critically not changing it on existing customers; it's on new ones to right. to, to learn from. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. Cheers. That was really interesting. Thank you. And, uh, See you in the next lunch. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.